Uh, I'm Fritz Mayer. I'm the Dean of the Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's discussion um, about uh, advancement and retention of persons of color in global affairs and academia, and indeed in the, in the not-for-profit sector as well. Um, uh, this is uh, the first of what will be a series of conversations sponsored by a really remarkable program, the International Career Advancement Program, or ICAP, which uh, founded and led by my colleague and predecessor as dean here at the Corbell School, Tom Rowe, um, which has provided mentorship and training uh, to hundreds, really, of uh, young professionals uh, in these fields, and whose whose alumni are really a who's who uh, of persons of color in 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 uh, what have been traditionally, frankly, white dominated professions. So, uh, we're very pleased to be having these conversations uh, on on important topics this year, um, and and especially uh, perhaps today, although admittedly a sobering topic, um, which is is about the the. Um, departure of persons of color um, in international affairs that we've seen uh, in some quarters in government and academia, perhaps in the not-for-profit uh, sector, um, uh, sparked a bit by uh, an article that appeared in Politico about the departure of a large number of, of uh, Black staffers who left the White House uh, in the current administration. Uh, who have either left or were planning to leave the uh, Politico said, at least uh, some had coined this Blacksit. Um, um, and and uh, we've seen this in academia. We've had indeed seen this a bit at the University of Denver. And so um, these are this is an important topic, uh, both the departure, but more generally the challenges faced by persons of color in these professions. We have a great panel uh, today uh, with us to discuss this, um, frankly, worrisome trend. Um, and I'll just introduce the panelists in, in I guess, an alphabetical order um, briefly. And along the way, they'll probably share their own experiences. So I won't go too deeply into their bios that we would be here all day, actually, if I, if I went through the remarkable credentials of this group. Um, let me begin with my, my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Nazneen Barma, who's Associate Professor and Founding Director of uh, the Scribner Institute of Public Policy here at the University of Denver. Uh, Nas is a political scientist whose work spans topics including peace building, foreign aid, the political economy of development, and global governance with a regional focus on Southeast Asia and the Pacific. So welcome, Nas. Uh, also joining us today is Francisco Vincomi, um, who is uh, Asia Pacific Advocacy Manager of Amnesty International USA. Uh, Francisco's had a, a varied career in multiple uh, positions. Uh, on Capitol Hill, um, uh, with the Open Society, uh, and several positions at State Department. So really uh, quite a career um, in DC. Um, uh, and uh, welcome, Francisco. Thanks for being with us. Um, hopefully joining us shortly will be Linda Eaton, uh, who's Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Development and Global Health. Uh, she's uh, uh, had a remarkable 20 years of experience in government, dealing with crisis management, global health and development, policy making and analysis, democracy and human rights and multilateral affairs. She's worked at the National Security Council at USAID and also with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, so we hope that she will be able to join us shortly. Um, um, and then... Um, Margaret Wong, uh, who is a president and CEO of the Southern Poverty Law Center, which uh, an organization I'm sure um, all of you know about. Um, she has had a, a remarkable career um, in, in the nonprofit sector uh, as an advocate for human rights and racial justice, um, and, uh, and now serves in this uh, uh, as a physician of, of a, a very important institution in, uh, in, in certainly in the US South. You may hear from my voice that I grew up in the South, um, very familiar. So Margaret, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and last, is, uh, but certainly not least, um, my colleague, um, Arthur Hart Jones, um, who is a professor emeritus of music, culture, and psychology at the University of Denver, um, and uh, he he has um, 
uh, he's quite a varied. He's a clinical psychologist, but also uh, 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 involved with music. He's, he's, he's actually a performer and singer. Uh, he's affiliated with our Lamont School of Music, and he spent um, uh, an impressive career in higher education, including more than three decades here at the University of Denver. So, uh, Art, great to have you with us. So with that, um, as, as you can all see, it's just a fabulous uh, group. So let me just start with a, with a, with a question uh, just to get a, to kind of level set and in, 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 uh, help me and others understand just how significant a problem is this uh, the, um, uh, uh, in, in the realms that you, that you know best. Um, to what extent are we seeing um, uh, significant departures uh, of of people of color from from these realms, and um, I don't know where to start exactly. Maybe we we'll start with 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 a sort of governmental perspective. Um, uh, perhaps I'll turn to you first, Francisco, um, to talk about uh, your perspective on that, and then we can come around and talk about the nonprofit sector and 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 the uh, and academia as well. But uh, maybe I'll uh, just start with you, Francisco, to get your thoughts on this. Happy to, Fritz, and, and let me say it's an honor to be here with you all. Thank you to the Corbell School, to ICAP uh, for the invitation, um, and the great co-panelists uh, to, sh to share this moment. Um, so just a quick clarification, I'm actually at the Department of State now as a senior advisor to the Assistant Secretary at the East Asia Pacific Bureau, uh, but I should say that uh, my remarks or anything I say here today are representative in my own personal capacity, not of the administration or the State Department or the office that I'm in. Um, but I think what, um, to your point about what where government is now, um, comes at a really important time. Um, and ICAP alumni, uh, but for the very first time, uh, the Biden-Harris administration appointed a chief diversity uh, inclusion officer, uh, Ambassador Abercrombie Wynn Stanley, uh, who was one of the mentors when I participated in mm -hmm. ICAP, um, and fabulous. has really just recently unveiled a DIA strategic plan for the State Department. Um, as well as uh, the White House instructed every agency to also have a chief diversity officer across a whole of government approach. Um, and this really came across uh, multiple years of pushing from organizations like the ICAP alumni um, and others um, to really make this conversation, the, the focus of this panel, um, a highlight in government conversations in the broader national security and foreign policy space. Um, I'll say that when I was working for Senator Menendez, the first Hispanic uh, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, we commissioned a GAO report that actually found uh, that uh, since 2002 to 2018, uh, the uh, numbers of Hispanics and African Americans have largely stagnated. Um, so in cases of African Americans in, in those years, it's actually gone down. In the cases of Hispanics, it's increased from five to 7%, which is nowhere near uh, the mm. overall representation in the overall population. Um, and when it comes to senior level, uh, we certainly see a decrease across underrepresented groups. So that's, to, that's just the data. I think we all have probably stories. We know that certain rooms um, and power is not always reflected on those issues of data. Um, and that uh, when it comes to the uh, positions of power, um, you know, oftentimes um, different underrepresented groups are, are frankly not in those positions, um, yeah. their views are not heard, and that really impacts our foreign policy. So I'll leave yeah. it there. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll come back around for sure to, to talk about both the, I mean, the, the consequences of this, the costs of this, uh, the, you know, uh, but also the causes of that. Um, let me let me turn to you, Mar uh, Margaret, if I could. Um, in your experience in the not-for-profit sector, do you see are, are the trends similar um, uh, or or different there? Uh, well, I, I'm sure I won't surprise anyone by saying they're quite similar. I also want to add my thanks to the Corbell School and, of course, to ICAP, um, of which I'm a proud alum. I attended the program in 2003, and it was um, a foundational experience for me and obviously for so many of my colleagues who participated. So I think the best message of ICAP is to pay it forward. Um, and I think that's been one of the most outstanding parts of the program is being able to go back and support other ICAPers as they go through and think about their careers. 
In the nonprofit sector, Fritz, um, we are looking at a sector that employs about 10% of the US workforce. It is a sizable percentage of the population. And there are about 1.5 million organizations in the United States that are nonprofit. These include everything from faith institutions and schools to, of course, advocacy organizations and human service organizations. And one of the things that we see consistently is that there are um, many, many opportunities for people of color at entry level positions. People of color frequently mm -hmm. constitute a majority of the entry level positions. But as you move up in opportunities and in rank in those organizations, that statistic changes dramatically. And there's been some really excellent work by a group called the Building Movement Project, um, which is looking at the nonprofit sector and understanding how issues of race and employees uh, who are people of color are faring in the sector. And it's very clear that there are not opportunities for advancement, for um, elevation of position for many, many people of color, despite the fact that people of color have at least equivalent, if not better qualifications for many of those positions. And so we're seeing the same barriers to progress in the nonprofit sector that we see in government and in the for-profit sector. And just to highlight, I mean, you, Francisco, alluded to this as well. It's not just the total numbers; it's the it's the rank, it's the it's the advancement within the it, within the career. Um, I don't know, uh, Art, whether you or Naj wants to take the question uh, at the. Um, at the university level, maybe by virtue of seniority, Art, I'll, I'll turn to you. Uh, you've watched uh, this university over uh, some period of time, um, but uh, also I think you've, you've had a, a sense of the broader landscape. Uh, what's your perception of the nature of the trends in, in academia? I, you know, I, I think I have the advantage of uh, probably being the one person on this panel that has been in so many different realms. Um, I served as an officer in the Navy during the Vietnam War. Um, I've been in private practice as a psychologist. I've worked in a medical school. I've worked in um, four different liberal arts oriented universities. Um, and what I see is that I think the overall issues that people face are really pretty much the same everywhere. And they have to do with these structures of power and privilege and, and racism and so forth that really, they're not confined to any specific um, place. And to me, it's just so interesting how these same patterns come up everywhere. And I like to think in terms of a revolving door. Um, I recently was um, reading the autobiography of W.E.B. Du Bois and he talked about enrolling at Harvard University at the turn of the 20th century, when where there was a big push to, to recruit um, black people, black students to study at Harvard and black faculty. And it was this big sort of thing. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it's almost like you could be talking about 2020. Wow. Um, it's like the same issues come up over and over and again. And I think one of the overarching things that I see is that um, often um, when these institutions attempt to bring in people, um, it's, it's really mainly from the perspective of the needs of the institution. It's sort of like, I think in mm -hmm. academia right now, one of the things that's happening is there's a big panic about where the students are gonna be coming from as the demographics change. And so all of a sudden there's this big need to make sure that you diversify, that you have people in there, but, but there's not a lot of attention that's really directed to the needs of the folks that you're bringing in. Mm -hmm. And so you, can't, you, know, you, get a, you get this warm welcome, um, they wanna bring you in um, and they, wouldn't it be exciting if you would join us and all of that other stuff and you get there and you realize that you have a lot of things that you see that other folks don't see. You see all the issues. Um, other people don't really have a responsibility to do that or a need to do it. And then you get roped into trying to solve all the problems. So there's a tax 
on folks. So mm -hmm. there's an issue of racism in the institution. You're the, you're the one that's supposed to solve it instead of the people that yeah. created yeah. the problem. So um, it, you, that's, how, that's how people leave. And that's how cycle starts all over again. I've seen it everywhere. Yeah, um, I did uh, no justice to your full uh, biography, and let's we'll, let, let's be sure to come back on on this on that particular issue and the others that you raised. I did want to uh, bring Nas into the conversation as well, and Nas, um, uh, in addition to your role here, you know, one of your roles has been um, uh, as the as a PI now of uh, Bridging the Gap Project, and you've been part of an effort to. Um, that really has touched a, a, a whole generation of scholars coming into academia. And I was just wondering whether whether you might reflect from from that perspective as someone who's really in touch with uh, with the kind of next generation of scholars in, in international affairs, what you're seeing. Thank you. And let me just echo my uh, fellow panelists and, and how great it is to be here today and, and to be with all of you. Um, the, the way that that I've sort of um, thought about this, uh, the, the the challenge that we're talking about here is in the context of uh, the the, the uh, phrase that has been coined is the leaky pipeline. And I think we're all familiar with this concept. It was kind of initially coined, I think, with respect to um, the, you know, the, the leaking of women from the academy. But I think it speaks to many of the issues that um, Francisco, Margaret and, and Art have raised in this sort of initial round of comments about, uh, you know, the entry point not necessarily being the issue, but how um, the different fields that we work in and that we occupy are structured so that the problem is, as people move through the career advancement pipeline, uh, that's where, uh, where, where we're losing our, our, our colleagues who are um, for coming from historically marginalized group and in particular people of color. The one statistic that kind of really struck me when I was doing some research on this for, for a piece I wrote was that in the, um, in the American United States population, uh, around 40% of the the American population identifies as non-white. In the academy writ large in uh, 2017, so five years ago, it was 28% of assistant professors that identified as non-white compared to 40% of the overall population and only 19% of full professors. So that shows both the, the fact that there's a there's a choke point in entry and that there's a there's a leaking kind of throughout the, the, the pipeline itself. Um, you know, I, I think um, just to kind of pick up on a couple of other themes and I think hopefully respond to your question more directly, Fritz, um, it's it, the, the question kind of regarding the staying power of, of people of color uh, in, in, in academia and in the field of international affairs. Um, I think we've seen more people coming into the pipeline. That's what I've seen over my 15 years of, of work with uh, mm -hmm. Bridging the Gap uh, in academia. I also worked at the World Bank before uh, uh, coming into academia and so kind of can speak from that perspective too. I think we see more uh, historically marginalized people coming in at the outset. Uh, the issues really relate to, I think, what Art just kind of you know uh, put so well, the tax uh, that is imposed on uh, those of us who, you know, who, who enter the profession, the invisible burdens and obstacles um, that people of color face and um, uh, the, the extra invisible work uh, that they have to do. That's great. Well, uh, thank you. Well, there are a lot of common common uh, themes. It's fascinating how common actually across the sector the problems are. So, so whether we use the, you know, the leaky pipeline or other metaphors, um, you know, one thing that's coming out clearly is, 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 uh, there may be pipe, the pipeline problems too. I mean, you know, the starting initial issues as well, but there's a, certainly a significant issue around advancement and and retention. Uh, so let's let's take there are a couple of different themes here, but we can talk about others as well. You know, one one is this phenomenon. Uh, Art, I think you put it well that uh, historically marginalized people are asked to solve the problem that others created. Um, talk about um, maybe we could uh, elaborate a bit on that, and and uh, we could go. I'm, I'm curious, sort of, Margaret, whether you've seen that as well in the not-for-profit sector, because um, we 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 heard a bit of that in in the comments about academia and, and in in uh, government. Yes, actually, Fritz, um, another recent study released by the Building Movement Project I referenced, they actually mm -hmm. uh, took a closer look at approximately 10 or 12 nonprofit organizations that had recently seen change in, change in leadership. They went from longstanding white leadership to leadership by people of color. And what they found across every single one of those organizations that where they did in-depth interviews with both the former and new leadership as well as board of directors, is that the, the new people who were hired to come in and run the organization 
also well understood that they were coming in to address issues of discrimination, racism, and sexism that had long mm -hmm. existed in the organization. So exactly to Art's point, they knew that they were hired to come in and fix those things on top of doing the regular full-time oh. job of managing an organization. Additionally, many of them also understood the expectation that they had to defend the legacy and record of their predecessor, regardless <laughs> of their perceptions of whether that was due or not. That's tough, yeah. And so that's a huge burden on a new, a brand new uh, head of an organization who's also dealing with all the typical challenges of fundraising, management, organizational challenges. But to have that additional burden is one that that actually was quite overwhelming for many of these new CEOs, many of whom were doing it for the first time. So I think Art summarized it beautifully. It is a, it is a consistent challenge. And the reason that we see it across all sectors is because it's grounded in structural racism. It's, it's not about sectoral challenges. It is a, a, a fundamental institutional challenge in our society. So um, we could go a lot of different ways with this. Let me let me let me bring Francisco back in just to just to kind of close the loop in terms of whether you you know you you see the same kind of issues in your experience um, now at state as you point out, um, uh, um, um, but elsewhere in your career. Um, and then let's drill down on uh, um, on the structural features of perhaps that that um, that underlie this um, uh, that may or may not be within our control. But then, you know, we've, we always want to want to think about things we can do to make things better. Um, but Francis, uh, Francisco, your thoughts. Thank you, Fritz. Uh, and I, I must say, I've had the pleasure of working for Margaret and an NGO. I've had um, a person of color at the philanthropy that I served at Open Society, and I mentioned earlier, working for the first Hispanic chairman. Uh, so I've been blessed to have great leaders uh, throughout my career. I'll say that um, to take the point further about structural issues, it's ultimately about power. You can have the data, you can have the strategies, you can have the internships, all of it, but if unless white people at the top decide to give up that power, um, unfortunately, we're not going to see the change um, that we ultimately want to see. And so I think about it sometimes a little bit about um, how I think about campaigning and politics. You kind of need an inside outside strategy. You need to have pressure from different parts of the sectors, right? So recruiting from NGOs, recruiting from think tanks, private sector, any place that has pipeline, a healthy um, revolving door of government to private sector, to nonprofit, to all these different, really cultivating um, and continuing to grow, challenge these power structures, but also advancing um, these power structures so that it keeps, um, ultimately, we can have a, you know, a senior foreign policy that is actually representative of this country. So, well, let's let's come. Up, we'll, I'm going to come back to the power. You know, I'm I'm acutely aware of being, uh, you know, white male doing the moderating of this. You know, in, in a position of power in my institution, and so, you know, just to let's just acknowledge that fact in the in this uh, context. Um, I think it's. Um, I want to come back to that because it 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 um, you know for those of us in these privileged positions, it's a, it presents a challenge for us. You know, to be to be frank about it, uh, and how uh, how we can uh, do you know do what we can uh, while also advancing the mission and trying to do the the best we can for our organization. But let me come back to. I want to I want to drill down just a little bit more, maybe in the academics uh, side though, on this. Um, on this tax, this additional burden uh, that is, um, and we, we talk a lot about this in academia, the invisible work that um, um, faculty of color are called upon uh, in a variety of ways, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, always being the person called on to serve, be the person of color on the committee, or whether it's to uh, additional burdens of advising uh, students who uh, need additional, you know, who, who look to, uh, to 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 mentors who look something like themselves, etc. So I'm curious, and maybe I'll come to you, Nas, first on on this. So sort of your your take on that as um, as a as a as a factor in the struggles and the in the uh, that, that that many um, 
um, faculty of color face in, in places like the University of Denver? Yeah, um, thank you, Fred. I think it's a really important question. I think it absolutely contributes to the, um, you know, to the to the lack of career progression and advancement. I think of it in the concept context of um, what people have called role fatigue. Right, how exhausting it is to be the only X in the room uh, at a meeting. Uh, if you're feeling like you're having to represent the voices of, you know, a, a number of voices, sort of not just your own, uh, in, in in the context of mentoring in particular, uh, where there are kind of fewer faculty of color but more students of color because of that kind of pipeline that we that mm. we talked about. Um, you know, there's sort of more of an advising burden in sheer numbers. Um, certainly, in terms of committee work, for the reasons that you know that Art I think uh, kind of put his finger on uh, uh, very nicely, but it does come down to a sense of sort of actual exhaustion, uh, kind of physical, emotional uh, tax uh, that is very hard to sustain over the course of a, you know, of a successful career and in terms of su successful career advancement. And I think that plays a big role in the leaking of not just uh, faculty, I should say, I think also staff uh, of color from, from the university setting where uh, that sort of expectation of, of constantly playing a certain role, uh, you know, is, is indeed very draining. Yeah, yeah. Or uh, calling you to elaborate on that, but but I'd also be interested in your experience, and then we'll come back around. Uh, if we're, we're focused on this particular challenge, which I, you know, uh, is clearly a, a, an issue for for uh, not just the people in academia, but in, in in all these professions. I'm curious what what you've seen that works um, or that's helpful in this regard, and whether they're um, you know, certainly better or worse ways to allocate the, the work of a place. Um, but uh, so, so you know, obviously feel free to, to elaborate uh, you, uh, on, on the nature of the problem, but I'd also be really curious and then I'd love to come around uh, to the group in, in terms of, all right, what, what are the, on, on this issue in particular, when we talk about others as well, what are, the, what are some structural things that can be done that really would make a difference? Yeah, so, um... I think this gets really, really complicated because part of the issue that, that is faced here is there's not only the tax, um, not only the things that you're kind of expected to step in and do, but there are also boundaries placed on what you're allowed to do. And mm -hmm. so if you come into the you come into a situation where um, there are people who are in a department who feel like they're being discriminated against and you go in and you meet with that person and you provide support. If you then step in and say that the main problem, if you call out the main problem as being internal problems, then you get labeled as disloyal or irresponsible mm. or whatever. So it's like a there's a double bind that, mm. that kind of exists. And it is really, 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 really hard. And, I, and again, I've seen it in all of these different realms. And I've also been a consultant to the the ICAP problem, uh, program, and I've seen it in all the, um, the stories that the fellows tell about what they're doing in their work. Um, so in terms of solution, I think what really needs to happen is to have um, a lot of professional development for the folks who actually are in power that allows them to see this kind of problem and allows them to step aside and to give up that power and to allow the people who really know what's going on. And unfortunately, if you've been, or fortunately, depend, depending on how you wanna look at it, if you've been, if you had this experience as a person of color in these, in these places, you know a lot. And you know a lot oh. about what needs to be done, um, but you don't often get to have the power to implement the things that you think need to be done. And I think there are good people. I mean, I've seen in terms of like the good experiences, oh. It's when I see um, a person who's in a senior leadership position who really does get it. Um, it's amazing the kinds of stuff that can happen when they open the door and allow what needs to happen to happen and not feel threatened by it. Um, there's also another issue, a cultural issue, I think that's really, really big, is what is the nature of power? Um, and I think in our, in our American hierarchical kind of culture, power gets seen as you get to tell other people what to do and you get special mm. privileges or whatever. And that actually ultimately is not very satisfying. Um, my experience has been in lots of community settings that I've been involved in. When people come together to solve a problem together, 
everybody feels more satisfied and there isn't so much of a need to have mm. quote unquote power. Um, so it's, um, but I think that when, when good people open their eyes and, and are allowed to allow themselves to kind of see what needs to be done, a lot of good things can happen. Yeah, it's just interesting to deconstruct power and to think about what you know whether whether yeah we can yeah. we can even revisit yeah. that that question. You used the phrase double bind that sound you know similar, Margaret, to what you were talking about the in a way the um, the that uh, in your case the need to uh, on the one hand uh, you know change things and the other say that uh, you know everything has been great in your organization <laughs> along the way um but i wonder if your your reflections in terms of both the problem again but but again in terms of the the uh um the ways that we can we can at least improve matters well i do think um there are so many of us now who had opportunities that it does give us the chance to to take the best practices and lessons we've learned along the way. Um, I certainly believe that mentorship programs are vital for this mm -hmm. kind of work. It helped tremendously that the first um, executive director role I had, I was hired by a woman who became my mentor um, and who supported me in that role and enabled me to take on that role. And she was also a woman of color. So really, thinking about the kinds of experiences she knew I would have and speaking out and supporting me as I, as I took that journey. I also think programs like ICAP, where we deliberately build pipelines of mentorship, um, where we're looking out to support mm -hmm. one another, and that enables opportunities. So when issues come up that all of my co-panelists have referenced, when we see issues of disparity or discrimination or bad behavior, we can't ask the people who are on the receiving end of that experience right. to be the ones to challenge it. So it needs to be one of us or someone else who steps up. Um, and I think that we had a lot of discussion about the risks that people take when they speak out at ICAP. Um, and I just had the chance to return as a mentor last week to the ICAP program. But it's very clear that people do pay prices for speaking out. And so those of us who have more privilege, more um, rank that we've achieved, it's on us to make sure that we're speaking out and calling out attention to those problems. The last thing I would note, Fritz, as um, something that I think all sectors need to be paying more attention to is the provision of mental health services to mm -hmm. everyone. I think particularly Naz and Art have referenced the toll that it takes, um, but I know Francisco and I have both experienced it as well. It takes a tremendous toll on, on individuals who are faced with these challenges and we need to support that through significant investments in mental health services. This is a, a late to the game issue. Many, many employers have not prioritized mental health services. And of course, our whole healthcare system that is so unique in the world um, has <laughs> many, many challenges, but another structural racism issue we'll have to talk about another time. But yeah. all that to say, um, we've actually prioritized that at the Southern Poverty Law Center. And I think, I think that makes a difference when employees know that their employer is aware of challenges, is supporting them to get any support they need, and it helps as we go through these processes together. Yeah, that's very helpful and very, uh, a series of very uh, specific things that uh, can be done. I should note, um, before we, uh, I should, as those in the audience can tell them, uh, we could talk at some length uh, without involving you, but there is a Q&A uh, function. If you have questions, put put your questions in the, in the Q&A. And we'll try to get to um, as many of them as as we can. Um, uh, so um, let me uh, well, well, let me just note, you know, I, I'm listening carefully to this and thinking about, you know, the role of someone in my position uh, and in my particular organization and what I can do. Um, and uh, I, I, I at least um, uh, imagine myself being someone who is uh, providing, you know, making it safe to speak out and uh, um, and who is uh, something of an ally in that regard, but um, well aware of uh, 
inevitable shortcomings and fail failures in that regard. And, I, I, and, and that's sort of a segue to, to come back to this question of power. Um, and, uh, you know, it's hard to give up power. You know, if I'm, if I'm honest, I like, you know, being uh, the dean. Um, um, and um, I, I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, coming back maybe to Francisco, you raised it first. Is is what what does that what can be asked? What is what does that look like um, when you're when you're um, basically uh, a, you know asking for a real seat at the table um, um, when 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 maybe it's uh, it's been a kind of fake seat at the table um, for a long time. Um, what is what, what does that look like and 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 maybe even what is what is it what is a challenge and I'll just use myself as an example for for you know someone like myself who's who is uh, you know acknowledging that uh, I enjoy certain privileges what does that look like that conversation with with yeah, it's, it's a good question, Fritz. I think, you know, um, part of it is succession planning, right? So I'm a big uh, Game of Thrones uh, sort of uh, recent watcher. Um, and it's all about what happens after you, right? Um, if, if, if as a leader, you have not you know, cultivated or nurtured or sponsored the next three to five um, people that will be in, in a prime spot from underrepresented groups to take over you, then you have failed as a leader, right? Um, and we have to be able to co uh, hold other leaders accountable to that principle and to that kind of um, accountability and leadership qualities um, when we sort of figure out who our leaders are. So I think that's one. Um, on the proverbial table, um, you know, we always talk about be, uh, you know, sort of being in the, uh, being, in, being in the room versus being invited to dance. Um, I think it's mm -hmm. important to, um, you know, make sure that people are heard, not just have a, a, a seat. Um, I'm also a big fan of when the table's not being expanded or we're not given a seat at the table, creating our own table so that, um, you know, creating a, a parallel structure of power that then tends to shift the narrative to more inclusive spaces. Um, it's a little bit harder because harder to do that with government because you can't create an alternate form of yeah. government, but but you can do that when the private sector, when the nonprofit sector is clearly uh, taking talent from um, the government. Um, and, and that's why people of color or, or other underrepresented groups want to want to leave, um, but then also being intentional about you know making sure that your colleague is being heard. Like you know, I, you know, X or Y person, what are your thoughts on this issue? That to me stands out as important uh, leadership qualities. Yeah. Um, no, it's very helpful. I'm, I'm curious, about Art or, or Naz, whether uh, coming at it, uh, Art obviously from multiple sectors, but both of you, uh, you know, with the considerable experience in the in the academic realm, whether those are the kinds of things that that come to mind uh, for you as well. Yeah, I can. Um, I, I'd like to give an example of what happened, um, a personal experience in the Navy. Um, so when I was in the Navy, I was um, I was assigned to. I went to officer candidate school, and then I was assigned as an uh, as a uh, dispersing officer on a destroyer escort. And one of my one of the taxes that I had was I was supposed to keep all the black sailors happy, right? That the the mm -hmm. captain of the ship was really upset that the black sailors were always complaining about everything. Um, they wanted to wear afros and they wanted to do all this other stuff. And, and he was kind of sick and tired of all these complaints and why couldn't these sailors just do their work? And um, I would try to explain to him what it was like, um, you know, being in this, being on the ship and not and feeling like your needs are not being heard and he just wouldn't listen. And mm. one of the things that ended up happening was we got we got um, sort of privileged with a visit from Admiral Zumwalt. Yeah. And Admiral Zumwalt during the Vietnam War was one of those senior leaders who spoke out and supported folks who listened in a way that other leaders didn't listen. And so when he came to the ship, um, 
uh, the captain was explain was complaining to him about all these things, and and Admiral Zumwalt essentially gave him the same advice that I had given him. Um, and once that visit happened, everything changed. Um, mm. the, you know, thankfully the captain of the ship, there was an aha moment that that opened up for him. And after that, he called me into his, his stateroom and he said, Art, let's talk. You know, I'm sorry I haven't listened to you. What can we do? Um, we, you know, we changed the way the ship store did their inventory for, you know, you know, products for, you know, people who want, you know, kid, um, so sailors who wanted to, you know, have, um, you know, a pick to, you know, and to grow out their hair and to have black products and all of this other stuff and the whole culture of the ship, 220 men on the ship, the whole culture was transformed. Um, and so those last three months that I was there before, you know, I, before I left the Navy, it was like, a, I felt like I was in a different place. And I think that when you have those kinds of personal experiences where you see that everybody feels happier um, and that the whole idea of somebody at the top just telling people what to do without really having a wide lens of understanding what the full problem is creates misery for everyone. When you, mm. when you have those kinds of experiences, that, that's what creates the momentum to do think bigger things. Um, and I, I'd love to yeah. know what happened to the captain. I, had, I didn't keep up with him. What happened uh, to yeah. him after that? But, but uh, I, well, I love that story. I mean, it, it, uh, uh, and your emphasis on, on just listening and um, uh, and, and, and coming to know each other as the, in our histories and our stories. I, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about storytelling and the role of just sharing people's stories in that. And Nas, I, um, it occurred to me and put you on the spot a bit, but you know, you and I've talked quite a bit about the, uh, you know, how how we bridge divides of various kinds in in the world we're we're in, but. Uh, I wonder if you're you sort of that 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 line of thought sort of resonates with you. Yep, very very much so. And just sort of picking up directly from from Art's really terrific example. I mean, I think what that illustrates is that power is both instrumental and normative, right? Um, I think a lot of what we're kind of all implicitly touching on is, uh, you know, the right and responsibility of, of people of color to actually set the tone for what constitutes acceptable behavior, right? I mean, I think often, you know, Fritz, you asked us to reflect on our own personal experiences as we were coming into this conversation. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, um, you know, to the extent that I've been successful, and in, in many ways, it's because I've been able to mimic what are dominant strategies in a field that has pretty clear criteria for advancement. Right. Uh, the problem that I have with the leaky pipeline metaphor that I used earlier is that it sort of promotes the notion of a single pathway, whereas really what we should be encouraging is a whole range of diverse pathways into the into the work that we're all talking about here. And I think, you know, Art's example is so great because it illustrates how kind of changing the instrumental power structure also changes that normative environment in really important ways. Well, um, so thank you. Thank you for that and sharing that. And yes, I did sort of in, in prep sort of, uh, you know, ask each of you to, to, to say a bit about your personal experience. Maybe we turn to you, Margaret, in terms of, of your own your own personal experiences navigating uh, the fields that you've been in. Sure, Fritz. Uh, well, I suspect there's going to be a lot of shared experience across my co-panelists. Um, I did a short stint in the US Senate for the Foreign Relations Committee just after I graduated from uh, Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. I spent about two years there. And then since then, I've been in the nonprofit sector. What I can tell you is it's not unusual in the nonprofit sector to not be able to move up in the same organization. Um, mm. Typically, a job opens, it's an opportunity, but there's no pathway for progression. And so my first several jobs were moving from one position to the next. So when I was ready to seek a, a, a next step in my career, I had to find a new organization as well as a new position. Um, the last couple of organizations I've been in, Amnesty International and the Southern Poverty Law Center, were big enough that you actually can have a career with progression in these organizations where there are opportunities for you to move up. Um, but I will say it is, it is still difficult. And I've been thinking a lot about Francisco's comment around succession. 
I think especially in the nonprofit sector where it's not unusual to have people who move every few years from one role to the next, that particularly leaders in the sector need to think about the role that they can play mm -hmm recruiting the next generation of leaders and making space for them. So that is something I'm actually talking quite a bit with my fellow CEOs about, about how we create those paths. Um, even though now many CEOs are people of color um, and we've only just arrived, <laughs> uh, but at the same time, we wanna think about how we create space for others to step in. Um, we don't need to have organizations that are run by the same person for 15 or 20 years. Uh, we need to have more ideas, more diversity of thought in leadership, and that's going to require us to take those steps. Yeah. Um, Francisco, you were just referenced, uh, but you, your work is certainly at state in a very different kind of uh, environment than um, than the NGO environment, certainly the smaller ones that, that you, that uh, Margaret, you were first referencing, you know, there's there is more of a hierarchy, more of a structure. People do have uh, long careers at, at state. Um, um, but you're, I'm just curious if you have uh, personal experiences uh, in your own career that you might want to share. Yeah, maybe maybe I'll sandwich with a good story, a bad story, and and, and some good, a good one. But um, I was I was lucky that in my first job on the Senate side, um, I was both helped recruited by an affinity organization, the Congressional Hispanic Staff Association. Then towards the end of my congressional career, or at least that phase of it. Um, I became the president of the Congressional Hispanic Staff Association, and we mm -hmm. helped create the Hispanic Diversity Initiative, convinced Speaker Pelosi to really create a pipeline um, at every level of House congressional staff. We also helped the Senate Diversity Initiative really focus on data, which as folks know, um, congressional staff and just getting members of Congress to be transparent when it comes to data is no easy task, but we really um, put the onus on mainly Democrats to, to, to take that uh, forward. Mm -hmm. Um, like I'm sure many of my panelists, um, issues of microaggressions um, have, you know, followed me throughout every stage of my career. Um, I spoke during my time at ICAP about being uh, Latino and Hispanic um, and always sort of being pigeonholed to work on Latin America issue, despite my entire career focusing on Indo-Pacific. Asia Pacific yeah. uh, issues and then sort of facing that duality of like, well, like, you know, I, I remember being in, in a new job, being like, did you really want to be here? Or like, oh. you know, why are you not in Latin America space? Um, to again, also being being like, well, why don't you work on DNI issues? Um, when again, I you know, I, I I really defer to folks who have really made a profession on it um, to to really do the job twenty four seven. Um, but then on to, to end on a, on a little bit of a positive note, um, you know, I really think, I know that there's, it's, a, it's controversial in, our, in, in some of these discussions, but code switching and the impact of diversity on innovation, I really think is um, under, uh, undersold as an argument. I think we got to change the narrative. It's not just mm -hmm. the right thing to do. It's valuable. It's important yeah. for all of the workplaces, not just the private sector, but as well as each and every one of the fields that we operate in. Uh, for why diversity of thought. I just came from two weeks in Southeast Asia where I traveled with a special advisor on disability inclusion. And let me just say, I think the foreign policy conversations are just grappling with race and ethnicity, and we have yet to really fully grasp the issues of disability, accessibility, um, inclusion when it comes to foreign policy. Our missions abroad, they are not accessible. Um, they're, we're not thinking about persons with disability when it comes to our foreign policy abroad. abroad but also how we serve our diplomats and the larger foreign policy workforce abroad. Uh, but uh, the special advisor always starts every conversation with us saying, you know, I encounter Islamophobia, I encounter sexism, I encounter ableism, and I encounter, um, you know, ageism as well. And, and, and I really, you know, but, but look at what I've been able to accomplish. And you know, I'm at the highest levels of US government. My sister is um, an engineer um, contributing to the field of science. Um, and you know, Special Advisor Mankara brings this wonderful story about how a you know, um, person with disability, Steve Hawking's of the world, mm -hmm. were able to contribute to society. Um, and I really think it's that intersectionality. If we just build spaces where we create the most inclusive space for the most amount mm -hmm. of intersectional uh, uh, groups, uh, then, then that really benefits everyone. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's not just 
better for us to have accessible information. Um, it, it really improves the whole classroom, improves every yeah. participant yeah. Um, that is taking that kind of information. So, yeah. yeah, I love that. And uh, the as you pointed out, it's it's uh, having diversity in the uh, in the workforce is not just uh, it is the right thing to do, but uh, the uh, seeing that as an asset, especially since we're talking about foreign affairs, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious if others want to want to jump in on that as well. It seems to me um, there's a there's a very powerful argument uh, which has to do with the fact that we are encountering people in the world of other with other cultures, ethnicities, backgrounds, ableism, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, diversity. So that it's actually quite a handicap if one only has a monoculture at home. Um, but I, I don't know, uh, Naj, you probably thought about this a fair amount. I, I don't know if you you would agree with that, or or, or, or you know, say it better, or or or. or, or well, I don't. I don't think I can say it better. Direction. I would just you know wholeheartedly agree. I think uh, that you know we we talk about um, this is the sort of the you know we should have a more diverse you know uh, group of professionals uh, uh, working on international security and foreign affairs because it's the more effective thing to do, right? Yeah. We can yeah. all agree that it's the right thing to. Do, but it's certainly also the most effective thing to do. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I guess just picking up on, on one other kind of underlying thread here is that, you know, um, Francisco, I thought your 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 example of the the, the um the the um the trip that you just took is really interesting because you know I think we all have to be conscious that at the same time the rest of the world perceives us as Americans, right? And the, you know, the, the sort of the the imperial project that it is that is associated with in many other parts of the world when we're talking about sort of race and international relations and so on, right? Um, I think it I think it only helps our case uh to have a more uh diverse and uh you know reflective group of uh Americans who have been historically marginalized from their own society to to, to make that case out the world. Yeah. Um, I would love to pursue that. I did promise that I would take some questions. I have now about to fail to do that, but uh, let me let me bring in a uh, um, question from uh, Madison Wicket. Uh, thank you, Madison, from um, it's, who writes, what are some strategies to include perspectives from uh, uh, persons of color in organizational DEI conversations without overburdening them? This is something we're certainly familiar with in academia. There. They're the key stakeholders in these conversations, um, and an all-white-led DEI initiative is not likely to be helpful. Um, Art, you've you've uh, you've certainly dealt with that in uh, uh, in in your uh, career uh, here and elsewhere. Um, yeah, I mean, it is it is, <laughs> it, it is a tricky subject because um, sometimes you don't. There's certain people that you don't want leading certain initiatives <laughs> because. Of where they are, but um, my experience has been that when people really are genuine and then when they're open to learning, I mean, in academia, the whole thing in academia, right, is that you're on a lifelong journey to learn things, and somehow people feel like they can learn about ancient Egypt, they can learn about nuclear physics, and they can learn about all this other stuff, but they can't learn anything about um, diversity. Um, and so I think the issue of like really having people be involved in their own training and education and being able to step into these roles, I think a lot of us would very happy to give it up. Um, I don't, you know, and I think that, and I've seen it actually, I've seen, I mean, it's not, this is not abstract because I've worked with some, some white male colleagues who have been tremendous in terms of their ability to do things. And they have credibility because they've really walked the, the walk, you know, and they've really done it. So I do think um, that this, this whole enterprise of making our institutions more inclusive should be a shared enterprise. It shouldn't be limited um, to those of us who have just been, you know, just happened to be born with, you know, in a different, in a, in a particular cultural situation. And, and again, I wanna go back to the whole thing is, it's not just an abstract thing to think that everybody benefits because they do, Every, everyone is happy. No, no. Is that, I mean, it's not, it's, it's not an altruistic task. It's a, it's a communal task that is designed to make the, the place that we all work in and the work that we do better for everybody. Um, it really is that, it's really where it's at. Yeah. 
Um, appreciate those, that, uh, that sentiment. Maybe, maybe, I know we're just about at time. I'm, I'm curious, maybe do a quick round, Robin. I, uh, at least some in our audience, uh, I hope, I don't know who's in the audience, are, are our students. Um, we certainly are, uh, have uh, a reasonable level of commitment to to uh, recruit and, and train uh, students of color um, um, and uh, acknowledging all of the challenges that uh, have already been spoken about and the obligations that come with that. But I'm, I'm curious um, uh, just to hear from all of you perhaps quickly, your, your advice um, that you would give uh, young, young persons of color who are aspiring to work in, in, in your field. Um, and maybe we'll just go around uh, quickly. Um, I'll start with um, start with Margaret, then uh, this is where you are on my screen, uh, uh, and then uh, have a quick last word in in terms of you know the advice that you would give um, people coming up uh, behind you. Sure, I would encourage everyone to ask for help, ask for information, ask for advice, seek out people who are doing jobs that you're interested in do informational interviews with them. You'll be surprised, particularly amongst people of color or other marginalized communities, members, how many people want to help and want to support you on the way. And then remember to do the same for those coming up behind you. Oh, great advice. Um, Rob, Francisco. Hard, hard to follow up with that. Um, but similarly, I just feel like people if, if they're job searching, they really just need to take the risk. Um, too often, we second guess ourselves. We let our inner saboteurs get the best of us. I've learned that uh, our colleagues who are overrepresented in the field do not uh, do not wait that chance. Um, and they mm. actually, you know, and for all that same reason, we should uh, be, you know, leaning forward a little bit um, and applying for that job. So, yeah, that's great advice, uh, Nas. Oh, just sort of echo the the you know the fantastic points made about how important it is to to find allies and mentors, and that there are many out there, uh, all of us on the screen, uh, and many many others willing to help. I would also point out that finding uh, your mentors in your own peer group is is really valuable. Uh, you are part of the generation that's going to be making the next set of changes, and and your allies are in your peer group uh, as well as uh, in uh, more advanced positions in their careers. Yeah, I was struck while all of you referenced a kind of peer group or organization, including uh, ICAP um, as mm -hmm. important institutions as well. Art, I'm giving you the last word on this. Sure, I, I would. I mean, I think I think we're all saying the same thing because <laughs> you know, it's that those are the things. The one thing I would add is find some source, really great, wonderful sources of support in your personal life. Um, so that you're not putting all of your eggs into the professional stuff where you're bound to just be stressed all the time. And it's not just about time. It's just because everybody's busy. But um, to find people outside of your workplace that, that can provide support and where you can really enjoy yourself and let yourself um, relax a little. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for those remarks. Um, uh, we are at time, unfortunately, that uh, I really uh, honored to be uh, part of this conversation. Uh, um, uh, let me thank ICAP um, uh, for all the great work ICAP has done over the years, but also for, for uh, sponsoring this um, uh, conversation today. And let me uh, thank all of you for joining us today. And, and, and great thanks uh, to our panelists uh, for your time today and, and, and very thoughtful reflections. So thank you all. Um, um, look forward to our next conversation uh, in the ICAP series.